Welcome back. You're watching Signature Television. Uh, we're switching gears to talk on uh, the economy. Um, some time ago, I think it was yesterday, when we were talking about the fact that the oil wealth is concentrated among the Nigerian elites. And in fact, the World Bank report stated that um, most of the oil wealth is actually uh, used by the Nigerian government to service its elites. Uh, we'll talk about the implications of that because we have a guest in the studio who will do justice to that and even a broader perspective about the economy as it affects Nigeria and Nigerians alike. We have with us live in the studio an economist. He is Mr. Ifediora Amobi. Good to have you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining in. I mean, um, we really didn't need the World Bank to say that to us because we have resources, we have monies. But then we have Nigerians who are suffering because of lack of the so-called resources that we claim we have. What is the implications of this World Bank report categorically stating that Nigeria's oil wealth are concentrated on a few Nigerian elites and these monies don't trickle down? Yeah, thank you. Um, the World Bank is actually correct uh, to a large extent. Um, and this just doesn't happen only to Nigeria. It happens to countries that have discovered oil, that have mismanaged the use of oil to make uh, the general population's livelihoods better. Um, what has happened, and let me just set a bit of the record straight. What the World Bank said doesn't apply or is not applicable to the present administration. It's something that has happened historically from the military up till today. Um, Nigeria has lost close to about three quarters of its oil revenue through the same process. And it's a process of corruption. It's, it results from inflated contracts. It results from um, you know, certain people in certain places having the privilege of their positions and the people they know to you know, take advantage of this loose, what we call the weak institutional uh, framework, whether it's the NPC, whether it's the central bank, whether it's even the federal government itself. Um, and so monies have been siphoned over the years. I mean, we're all familiar with the Abacha, you know, loot and other loots that have, uh, you know, been made public by um, the media over, over, over time. Um, and so it's, it's something that we have actually experienced. So if Nigeria has made, say, a hundred dollars in oil revenue over the years, 70 to 70, 75 dollars wow. of it, have been lost. Well, but, but again, the comments from the World Bank, uh, it, it doesn't look, it doesn't seem like something that we don't know. I mean, it's not new, right? But it's circumspect when it's coming from them because they are the ones that know where these monies are. Uh, these people at the highest level of authority in these African countries siphon these monies and get it back to them in their banks across the world. The Swiss banks, the American banks, and why is it that they are not calling out these people when these monies cross the border to these banks, and then maybe f you know get it back? Why come to the public to tell us about it when you can do beyond what you have what, what you are telling us? Yeah, because part of uh, the misconception the public has, at least most people have, they see the World Bank as the world central bank. The World Bank is not a bank. The World Bank is a development multilateral institution that lends money for projects. They don't give cash. So the World Bank has no jurisdiction over your you know, global commercial banks like uh, um, Citibank or you know, Barclays, etc. And so they can't call them out. It's a development institution. These are commercial banks. So they are, they are they actually on two different rails okay. that you know have very little or no Connection, interaction yes, yes you know over time so yes the world bank is there to advise and to assist developing countries at least poor countries raise funds 
for projects. And so uh, the way the World Bank actually operates is if, let's say, Nigeria wants a project done, you know, to build a port or thereabout, and the port is going to cost $10 billion, the World Bank doesn't give Nigeria $10 billion to build the port. The World Bank pays the, what they call OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, you know, the people who are actually bringing in the components to build the port for Nigeria. That way they have full control over how the money is disbursed. Because if they give it to the countries, whether it's Nigeria or Ghana or Sri Lanka or, you know, Suriname, that money will, you know, will grow wings. I'm, I'm shocked that you are revealing this because, I mean, if that's the case, how come all the World Bank initiative or interventions you know, don't trickle down. I mean, we, we hear these loans uh, every now and then, and these monies come, and then you, d you don't even see the infrastructure of some okay. sort. Yes, yeah, so this is where I now draw a line between the World Bank and the IMF. Okay. The IMF is another institution itself that's different from the World Bank. Okay. Now, as the World Bank is focused on development projects, the IMF is the one that now does the cash to improve economies you know, okay. to improve trade, to stabilize economies, etc. And so most of these issues that you just raised are more IMF related than World than Bank. World Bank. Okay. Because it's the IMF that now gives you the conditions for you to now borrow. But IMF isn't saying anything about what's happening. Um well IMF from my own economic perspective IMF wouldn't say much because it's the IMF that's even the ones advising government to um, uh, remove fuel subsidy. They're the ones advising government to, you know, float the Naira, etc. So a lot of what we are experiencing today in terms of the hardships and, you know, whether it will now eventually result in an improved economy over the medium to long term are prescriptions from the IMF. Hmm. And so what the World Bank um, chief was saying was that, yes, given what has now happened over time in Nigeria, if Nigeria had managed its revenue from oil over the years, there would have been more benefit to the country. I mean, take a country like Canada. Canada also exports crude oil. Norway exports crude oil. These are you know, developed countries that don't have the type of weak institutions that we have, that don't have the kind of corruption or mismanagement of funds that we have here. And so they use their own oil money and they channel it towards improving the lives of everybody. And that's why they have a higher, you know, GDP per capita, you know, their gross national product per capita in those countries than we do here in Nigeria. And so it takes us back to what a lot of people are familiar with, what's called the Dutch disease. You know, whether you actually um, you know, heard that. Dutch disease is where you've now taken, you know, your God-given wealth, you know, say oil, and you discover oil, you get excited about the oil. Everybody, every resource is now geared towards the oil sector to the detriment of other sectors manufacturing, agriculture, etc., you know, real estate and so on. Every everybody now gears towards, you know, the oil sector because that's where the real money is. So what are the implications of you know of oil wealth concentration on the Nigeria's elite? Now for the Nigeria's elite, and I mentioned earlier on, you know, it's it's now these elites that use their connections to now, you know, uh, going, everybody's now going in to get oil wells and sector and you know, there are so many contracts, NMPC and the rest of them, and these are inflated. So if there's a contract that is worth a million dollars, I'll probably get it for two, three million dollars. And there's no guarantee that I will even execute Executed. the one million dollars at a hundred percent. So not only has the amount of the contract tripled, which means that two thirds of the funds are gone. The one third that's even left, a fraction of it, you know, will also, you know, grow wings, um, and um, and um, uh, you know, 
fly away. So, and these things don't, they are not what the average person, like, you know, you and I, you know, would get. These are the same people. It's the same circle of elite friends that this money is just circulated around them and their families. It's a generational thing. So if you look at even some of the millionaires and billionaires that we have today, you know, it streams down from the same line. It's very, very few that are first timers, you know. And even those first timers, if you even go back and investigate, they are riding on the coat wings of some of these other, you know, people. Oh, I know, you know I went to school, for instance, with General so -so 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 -so's son or mm -hmm. daughter. So I used that connection and I built my own empire. It's still from the same source. It's still the same oil money that was supposed to be used to build the roads, provide water, um, you know, do all these things that would make life better for the general public. And if that had been done, then you would have seen an increase in productivity because people will be happier, more relaxed, there'll be jobs, productivity will increase and will end up being like a Norway or Canada. But the way things are today, while you're barely trying to, um, to, to, to get your public transportation in the morning to come to work, somebody is flying you know, on a private jet in the same country. And so when our statistics is being published, it shows that Nigeria is oil rich. So the country is rich, but the Nigerians are not. And so, you, you know, you have this small percentage or small fraction of the population, you know, called the elite, who control all of this. Okay, well, I'm just wondering, you know, the, the small group of people who are, you know, benefiting from this oil wealth, uh, I, I begin to think that they are much more occupied by government officials because the government has not, you know, officially come out to say anything about this accusation by the World Bank. Or is this something that I've done you know, uh, to, to talk to or to address this accusation by World Bank? Um, well, it'll be, I would actually be, be surprised if government comes out to say something negative because even if you look at today's government, it's still an offshoot of same previous governments mm -hmm. from the top to the bottom. If the person here today wasn't somewhere else, previously, then you're the son or daughter of somebody who had been there previously. There's still that connection. It's still that same line. So even your governor in your average state today was something somewhere before. Your senator was a governor. Your president was a senator, was a governor, was a local government chairman. Was. So it's the same government. And even as they get old or refuse to get old, their children and their family are taken over the same empire and the same people. Yeah. So who's going to complain? Right. Um, largely, I mean, we, we can't talk about the Nigerian economy without talk, talking about oil. Recently, we had Dangote Refinery coming on board. A lot of Nigerians were excited and happy about the fact that there has been some, you know, uh, breathing space with um, the competition, with people you know, referring to telecommunications as that's where our oil is headed, given there's a private sector in that, in that environment. And then, of course, as um, an NPC having its refineries, you know, pop off, even though we've seen over time that it hasn't been serious with Nigerians, telling Nigerians that um, the Port Harcourt refineries will come on board, and over seven times it hasn't come on board. And I'm just wondering how you explain what's going on in the oil sector, especially as regards to the pricing between Dangote and the NNPC and then the marketers. Well, the difference between, between the oil industry today and the telecom sector when, you know, it was commercialized and privatized was that in the telecoms era, it wasn't just one company that came up. Okay. There were a number of them. So, you know, it cut across and spread across and the effects were actually quicker or the benefits were quicker to see 
because you had a connect, you had MTN, you had this, you had that, you know. At the time, you even had smaller ones, you know, Railtail and Seltel and all those other ones that came across that still captured a bit of the market. Yes, they didn't last long, but they still played their role. Today, you only have Dangote. Mm. So, but at the time, it was MTN before um, Glonal came or so. MTN was the first. Yes, right? but they were all given licenses at the same time. Okay. So the difference in market entry okay. between MTN and Econet and Glow and uh, you know all the other ones oh, wasn't okay. Uh, yeah, it was actually you know very very short. So, but today you have federal government versus Dangote. The only other strong ally that Dangote has is maybe Otedola who is, you know, who is a friend and a colleague. Now, if there were three or four Dangotes that came into the market, built refineries, that number would have formed sort of an oligarchy that could have been able to now stand, you know, eyeball to eyeball with NMPC and the federal government. So, yes, he's fighting his battle uh, it's unfortunate because I was actually also one of the few people that really thought that, oh, once Dangote comes on stream, prices are going to drop. But as I saw things unfold, and even up till now, I still, I don't even think you know, anybody on the outside still knows what the intricacies are. Because we were not there when, you know, papers were signed and deals were struck. Um, so each side will, you know, will make its own strong argument why they're taking their own position. We can only try and analyze or speculate or you know, just guesstimate as much as we could until everything settles. But I am hoping, and I don't, I mean, of course, there isn't anybody who's building a second refinery as big as Dangote's. Now, the government refineries, the Port Harcourt, the Wari, uh, you know, Kaduna and the rest of them, in my own opinion, will never come, will never come on stream the way, we're, the, Why? the way we're going about them. First of all, there's, there are technology issues. A lot, of, a lot of what you have there is obsolete. These are refineries that were built in the 70s, 80s. Well, are you saying all this while the, the government has been lying that at the time that they are announcing that it's going to come on stream, it has, that I, I was thinking that at the time they were mentioning it, maybe a few things would come up but they would have to go and tighten their belts or something. Are, yeah. are you saying that you don't see it come, coming on stream at all? The intention was good. The execution was something else. I'll give you a practical example. If I give you a 1960... Peugeot 404 or 403 and I say okay I want this car to be able to race neck to neck with an S-Class or you know, <laughs> a modern car. no matter how much you put into that vehicle mm. it will not be like, like a 2024 vehicle with all the gadgets and technology and the lights and the push button is this not government inefficiency? Because again, if an individual can build a refinery within that space of time, yeah. uh, twenty billion dollars, how come government is not able to even build a new one, or even revive this one, or better still, sell it off to private, you know, That's the key investors? Now. Why didn't they sell it off? Why didn't they now say, okay, there's just absolutely no way we're going to be able to? It's just like uh, a lot of these things have to be scrapped and rebuilt because today if you take within this space you can build a modular refinery absolutely that has that can generate more output than worry refinery with all the land that's given and all the you know things in there so why pump money down a project you know 
will never see the light of day. And that's why every year there's turnaround maintenance. We always talk about TAM, 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 TAM. And it's billions and billions and billions of, of uh, Naira. And this money is being spent. And if you go to the refineries, the same padlock that was used with the <laughs> used to padlock it is still there at the gate. Wow. And nobody's probing. Nobody's asking. I mean, of course, you know, we're asking questions, but sometimes we're asking hush you know, because we know if you, be, if you actually get too loud, mm -hmm. <laughs> it will come for you. Yeah. You know, so it's something that we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to really say to ourselves, okay, we have certain basic economic problems that are not that difficult to solve. We have a, a huge pool of unemployed. We have poverty. We have all these, you know, uneducated population, especially in the Northeast and the Northern parts of the country. Let's us spend the next two, three years focusing on these groups. Cause this, this, this is the future of Nigeria. We are the elite. We are in our 70s, 80s, 90s, as much as we try to lie about our ages. But one day <laughs> we are going to, but you know, yeah, we will pass on. Nigeria will still be here. Hmm. Who now takes over? A lot of our children are outside the country. True. Even with all their degrees and they're the best in this, the best in that, they win all the awards, etc., etc. But they are not keen to come home. Because this same group that we have that we've been neglecting are the ones that will now jump their fences and attack them. They're the ones who will point guns to their heads as they're driving and say, get out of the car or I kidnap you. And that's just what happens. So when you so if you think that you are siphoning all this money and you're taking it and you're competing with your you know, elite neighbor to see you know who has who will now reach one trillion dollars at the end of the day there's only so you know so high you can build your fence hmm. if they can't climb it they'll tunnel through it one day because Absolutely. there's because there's desperation there's despondence in the land and so you know we have we have to completely change focus and realize that we have a, you know, a ticking time bomb that if we don't address it today, it will blow up in all of our faces. Okay, I'm just wondering how th this particular thing that the World Bank has come up to say, how has it, you know, impacted Nigeria's international reputation? And um, you talked about the generational heritage of uh, the elites in terms of the oil uh, wealth. And I'm wondering. Is there no one who is concerned about uh, the foreign investors, how they look at us after this uh, discovery by World Bank? Yeah, I mean, you know, we do worry. There are two types of foreign investors. The investors who come in to invest because they, ha because they have an interest. Okay. Or rather, there are investors who come in to invest because they are interested. There are others who come in to invest because they have an interest and want to exploit. Mm. So, you can have foreign investors flooding your airports they want to come in but if you don't ask yourself what are they seeing that you are not seeing mm. tomorrow you won't have a country and that's how a lot of our solid minerals are being cut up whether it's gold whether it's coal whether it's and nobody I mean, we take videos, we complain, we see these big trucks carrying copper and everything back and forth. But we don't, but we never know who is in charge. And as a community, it just depletes our environment. None of us are actually employed, but our wealth is being taken out by the same elite. So it doesn't just apply to oil. It also applies to the non-oil solid mineral sector and other sectors. And this is actually the imbalance or the tragedy that we face today in Nigeria. You know, we have this huge poverty gap. We have one of the worst human development indices in the world. 
we are the largest producer of oil in the, co in the continent. We are the sixth largest in the world. We're even on, in a, at the top when it comes to gas. We have all these things going for us. But without leadership or good governance, without strong institutions, everything will you know, go south. And that's what we're seeing. You, you mentioned that um, uh, earlier the IMF is the one that advises uh, Nigeria to devalue its currency and, 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 and do all of those things. Can you explain to me how is it beneficial for a country to devalue its currency and then um, also do the things? Because so, sometimes I, I wonder, is it the, the, the Chinese model that they're trying to, to advise Nigeria to do? Um, um, and they seen even with the advice, and they seen that it is it is eating up the Nigerian system. The, pop the populace are becoming poorer by the day. I mean, don't they care that the countries that they are asking to implement some of these laws or some of these um, financial co constraints on its people? That people who are being affected by their so-called advice. You know, the situation is kind, 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 kind of there. I don't know. I don't know. It's confusing. Yeah. Somewhere. Well, I wouldn't actually blame them 100%. The intention is good. To devalue your currency? Yes. Well, okay. Let's not see devaluation as negative, Okay. you know, in this context. Now, if I... I mean, if I fix my currency, you know, if I, if if um, if I keep revaluing or you know, you know, my currency because I want it to be stronger, and I'm not doing the fundamental things required for a strong currency, it's like pouring water into a basket. I'm saying, okay, this is. These are your capabilities. These are your resources. This is what you have. This, this is your potential. These are the opportunities out there. If, you're, if you weaken your currency a little bit, your economy will even grow faster. Now, it sounds like, you know. It's magic. What am I it's saying? Simple. Yes. The thing is this. Countries grow and develop when they produce and export. Countries that are import dependent cannot grow as fast as countries that produce and export. For you to actually export, you make more money if your currency is slightly devalued than you make if your, country, if, if your currency is quote unquote mm -hmm. strong as we see it. If I want to export this, if I, if I produce this in Nigeria and I want to export it, and the international price is one US dollar, if I export it, I get almost 1,700 Naira. If I revalue my currency, or I fix it, and I say it's going to be 2 to 1 or 10 to 1, right? When I export this, I get 10 Naira. I don't get 1,700 Naira. I only get 10 Naira. But I still have inflation in my country. Mm -hmm. So what will 10 Naira buy for me? Nothing. That 10 Naira benefits the person who will now bring it in. Because it now makes importation cheaper and floods my country with all sorts of goods from everywhere substandard which we, we have actually experienced as Nigeria so the issue now is not whether you're devaluing or not devaluing it's the rate of devaluation mm -hmm. because we are on a free fall or we experienced a free fall in recent times it now hit us harder but if 
you implement policy on a gradual, slow basis, it's easy for the population to actually accommodate. If government had said, for instance, or if the president had announced on that first day that I plan to remove subsidy, but I will phase it over it's been over time, yeah. Yeah, you know, two years now since he came. You know, well, almost. almost two years. Almost two years. Yeah. But I'll phase it over a two year period. And every month, two years is 24 months. If they do the calculation and say, okay, every month, if we add 50 naira or 20 naira, people will learn to adjust that there's going to be a slight price increase because the international price of oil is going up. Yeah. So you gradually ease off subsidy over time. It might even end up still being 1,200 today, but that shock, that overnight effect mm -hmm. will not be there. People will actually adjust, just like we adjust to every other price increase in any other commodity. Mm. Mm. But because that didn't happen and it was just sudden, it hit us, boom. Then you now uh, remove electricity subsidy like that. Then the telecoms do their own. Then the banking system does it. And suddenly, whoa, even the 70,000 Naira minimum, uh, wage. minimum wage has no effect. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's still yet to come. So it's not really, you know, whether you devalue your currency or whether you float your currency, it's how you manage the currency. And that's why economic management is not as easy as people think it is, because there are sorts of, you know, you have to weigh it, you know, lots of costs and benefits and see how you can work with time lags, you know, and then other variables that will come into play, even the ones you plan and the ones that are unforeseen. Because in the middle of all of this, there could be a major flood. Okay. Wow. Like in the Northeast, that will just come and just wipe out, you know, wipe out farms and everything else. So. There's a lot on the table, um, but if we go back to the subject, the oil money that has gone to the wealthy, if that was managed properly, the hardship that we're facing today would be less. It wouldn't be eliminated, but at least it wouldn't be as harsh on the average person as we see it today. Yesterday, uh, okay, th today um, the World Bank also came out, you know, since yesterday they have been trending came out to say that it would take Nigerians 100 years to overcome poverty. And I'm just wondering, is that a solution they are preferring to what is happening? Or are there other solutions, you know, long term, looking at the long term solution right now, they are preferring for Nigerians right now or the Nigerian government in terms of how they divert oil wealth? Well, yes. I mean, before you make a statement like that, you've looked at the scenario. You've looked at Nigeria today and you say, well, worst case, because it's always the worst case. That's the only way I can make you react is by saying to you, ha, by next tomorrow, if you don't stop eating, eating, you know, fried egg or thereabout, you will die. So you now look at that. That's the worst case scenario. And that's what makes you adjust. So what bank says to us, okay, given the way things are going today and from what we've seen and the corruption and everything else and the you know, poverty level going up and the human development index going down, etc., for us to come out of this, unless we really are honest with ourselves and make some really drastic changes, it'll take us a hundred years. So just in a meeting, a minute because of time, what long-term solution do you think Nigeria had to do in order to concentrate right now for the oil and gas sector? For the oil and gas sector, um, it's just basically to to be a bit more transparent, open up. You know, that is one sector that's t up till today, even with Nike and all these other institutions that have been set up, the average person still doesn't know what's going on there. I mean, it took NNPC almost two decades before some sort of, um, you know, an audited accounts could even be seen. So all these years of, you know, downstream oil and everything going on, importation, we don't even know. 
even experts will even tell you they still don't know what the landing cost because it, it keeps shifting, it keeps changing. They tell you, okay, landing cost today is 300 naira. Then there's 20 naira for this, 10 naira. For the adoption, there's no landing cost with Dangote refinery. So where are we getting landing costs from well, again? Dangote, well, they'll tell you yes, but Dangote imports crude. <laughs> from where? For that logistics. Oh, from, the, from various places. I mean, he, he just announced the other day that he's going to start importing crude from Guyana. Yeah, but yeah. he, he's been sold to crude from Nigeria. He's, Nigeria is selling crude to him in Naira. Yeah, but not enough. <sighs> wow. Not okay. Enough. Yeah, I mean, you know, he built he built a refinery that has a higher capacity than all the other ones that we've been putting money to put together. Mm. It's terrible, really. Um, just in just thirty seconds, um, this reforms that has been embarked upon by this current administration. Do you see a, a, a plus? Do you, do you see something that Nigerians can be able to smile at least in the next one year, if it remains like this? Uh -huh. Now, you said that if it, if it remains like this, no. <laughs> it has to change. Okay. Things have to change. Um, we have to focus less on a palliative-driven economy, which doesn't get us anywhere. You know. There is this joke, if you smile, they give you rice. If you cry, they give you rice. If you pray, they give you rice. <laughs> you know. So we have to start becoming, you know, start thinking about production, productivity, output. How do we harness, I mean, we're talking about 200 million people. There are countries that are jealous. If they the had number. this number of people, it's just like having a football team of, you know, 100 players. You can pick and choose anyone. As opposed to if you only had, you know, 10 players and you're looking for 11. So Nigeria has massive potential. Nigeria has the resources, whether it's human, natural, everything. And we don't have natural disasters like it, right, you know, as much. So what do we now lack? Like Chinua Achebe said, leadership, direction, planning. Hmm. If we sit down and honestly plan and put aside ethnic, religious, bigotry, or just say, okay, this is the Nigeria for our children tomorrow. Mm. Let us build it like we're building our own house. Let's not use substandard materials. Let us just focus, do the right thing, and sacrifice. Let's even, even, even sacrifice our own generation for our grandchildren. Wow. Let's leave it there. Yeah. I think we leave it there because of time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, you, Thank, you, Thank you for the insights. We truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.